Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our June 1st Tuesday. This happens to be our final first Tuesday of this academic year. And I want to first say thank you to our audience for joining in today and throughout this past year. Uh, it's been really wonderful hearing your questions, thoughts, and ideas. And we are so happy we've been able to share our speakers this past year with our entire global community. That has been really special. We anticipate we'll be able to bring our speakers and audience back to campus in August, but we do want to continue supporting our global listeners. And we're looking forward to also offering First Tuesday virtually for those of you who are, cannot be at, in the Twin Cities. I'd let, next like to thank Wells Fargo, a longstanding corporate sponsor for First Tuesday, and Twin Cities Business for their continued media support of the speaker series. Today, we're joined by our feature speaker, Terry Rasmussen, President and CEO of Thrivent. For our format today, we'll first hear a few short remarks from Terry. Then I'll ask Terry a few questions of my own before taking questions from our audience. So first, let me tell you a bit about Terry and Thrivent. Terry leads the financial services organization Thrivent, which is one of Minnesota's 16 Fortune 500 companies, and it's one of the largest not-for-profit organizations in the United States. Terry is also the first female CEO in Thrivent's history, and one of only 41 female CEOs leading companies in all of the Fortune 500. So for a decade, Thrivent has been named one of the world's most ethical companies by Ethisphere Institute. Thrivent was also one of the founding investors of the Carlson School's Kidwell Funds Enterprise, which gives students the opportunity to manage over $50 million of real client money invested in two funds, a growth fund and a fixed income fund. Before her current role, Terry was president of Thrivent's life, health and annuities business after serving 10 years as Senior Vice President, General Counsel, and Secretary. Prior to joining Thrivent, Terry held a series of legal leadership roles at American Express, including serving as Vice President and Managing Counsel there. Terry also serves on the boards of the American Council of Life Insurers, the HP Fuller Company, and the Walker Art Center. Terry, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, and and thank you, Shri. It's a real honor to be here, you know. And and it's it's um, such an honor to be with you and the Carlson School today. We are so fortunate to have such high caliber educational institutions like the University of Minnesota and the Carlson School of Business in our region. And so we're just blessed, I think, as an organization to have such wonderful institutions. So I know you said a little bit about Thrivent, but um, for those of you who are not familiar with Thrivent, let me share a little bit more about our organization. As Shri said, we are a Fortune 500 uh, diversified financial services organization with about $162 billion of assets under management and advisement. And last year, our revenue was about $8.5 billion. We've grown to this size since our founding in 1902 as a fraternal benefits society. And I wanted to share a little bit about our origin. Uh, if you can put yourself in a small town in Wisconsin in January of 1899, there was a flour mill there. And the workers at the flour mill were trying to start the boiler and, because it's cold in Wisconsin in January. And there was an explosion and one of the laborers of the mill was killed. And his wife and four young children received two things. First, they received a hundred pound bag of flour from the mill workers. And then the, the widow received a small check uh, life insurance payment. Now, a friend of theirs, in fact, the, the best man at their wedding was not satisfied with that. And so he made it his personal mission over the next several years to, to do something better with the community and make sure that the community could take care of each other. And he really wanted to bring financial security to that community. And so he on horseback achieved 500 signatures in three years and created a fraternal benefit society. 
And so now fast forward over 100 years later, we, we serve 2.3 million clients today with advice, investments, insurance, banking, and generosity programs. Now we're required as a fraternal benefit society to have a common bond, and it was Lutheranism at our founding, but now it has extended to include all Christians as of 2013. Now, many people think that Thriven is really a faith-based organization, but we're not. We actually are united in serving our clients who share the common bond of their Christian faith. So first, everything that we do at Thriven is really rooted in our purpose, our promise, and our principles. And our purpose is really why we exist. And we believe humanity thrives when people make the most of all they've been given. Now, this is a really summary sentence of, of three long-held beliefs that our clients hold. The first is that everything we have is a gift from God, and that we're called to be good stewards of those gifts, and that generosity is an expression of faith. And so for us, it is about the, the, the whole meaning of we exist to help humanity thrive, not just our clients. And so that's why I say we're really the original purpose-driven company. Our promise is what we exist to do. And in our case, again, that history and our founding is we help our clients achieve financial clarity so that they can lead lives full of meaning and gratitude. So we want to be known as that company that helps you lead that full life. We help people understand where they are today, where they want to be in the future, and what they need to get to their future. That last part of our promise is really important to us, and it's this whole notion of achieving financial clarity. The outcome is it gives you that ability to lead a life full of meaning and gratitude. Now, our principles are how we uniquely deliver on our purpose and our promise. And our first principle is this whole notion of fusing finance and faith. And so in our case, we're not gonna be known as the what's your number company. We're gonna be known as let us help you find your purpose, help you find your purpose in life so you can lead that life full of meaning and gratitude. And then we're gonna help you develop a strategy to protect against the unexpected, to build for your future and practice generosity. Our second principle is inspiring generosity. And I like to tell people we've got over 7 million inspire live generously t shirts out there. And so when you're out and about again look for those t shirts because I'll guarantee you'll see someone wearing them. But we mobilize volunteers in order to help them experience generosity practice generosity and be generous. And so they can improve the lives of, of people and the, in, in the, the causes that they care about and better their communities. And it could be as simple as building on a habitat home. It could be hosting a food drive to help with food insecurity, or it could be as simple as volunteering at an animal shelter. But we inspire all of that work because it's important to those that we serve. It helps them again, find that, that meaning, that meaningful life. So last year, Thrivent, their clients and friends, raised and donated more than $208 million to help individuals and nonprofits. Our third principle is invested in one another. Everything we do is in service of our clients. Our unique business model enables a client-focused, long-term view to all that we do and the investments we make, helping individuals and their communities thrive. This is something that really distinguishes Thrivent from other financial services providers, and I would say from other corporate providers as well. In addition to providing great advice and financial products and services, we mobilize clients to make a societal difference, whether through our support of their personal generosity or through our combined impact together. We help mobilize the 2.3 million of our clients. This also applies to how we conduct ourselves as a workforce. We're committed to caring for one another and creating an environment where everyone can thrive. Our fourth principle is simply transparent. Trust, I believe, is built on transparency and honesty. 
And we're committed to providing simple, clear, and meaningful experiences that are in the best interest of those we serve. So right now at Thrivent, we're in the midst of a transformation. So we can ensure that we're ready to serve not only our current clients, but future generations in the way they want to be served. And we know that we need to become much more client-centric. We have to become digital first. We have to give meaningful experiences. And we believe holistic and comprehensive purpose-based advice is, is how we can help achieve, help our clients achieve that financial clarity. So Thrivent has long been the best kept secret, and we're also trying to change that. And so we know today there's a segment of about 30 million people out there that really would want to do business with an organization like us. And so unfortunately, they have no idea we exist. And so we recently relaunched our brand and began our first ever national advertising campaign. And so right now, I'd like to share with you one of our recent award-winning commercials with you right now. An interest. There's interest you accrue, an interest you pursue, plans for the long term, and plans for a long weekend. Assets you allocate, and ones you hold tight. At Thrivent, we believe money is a tool, not a goal. And with the right guidance, you can get the financial clarity you need and live a life rich in meaning and gratitude. To learn more, text Thrive to 484848 or visit Thrivent.com. Thanks, Terry. That's uh, an amazing introduction. I mean, uh, to live a life with uh, meaning and gratitude, I think that's such a noble purpose. It's just amazing what you folks are doing. I mean, we talk a great deal at the school about business as a force for good. And I think you folks are living it, which is uh, just uh, so, so uh, you know, heartening. Um, you know, I know this past year has been unlike any other in recent memory. And in the middle of it all, you've also been leading this transformation. I mean, the first ever national advertising campaign. And by the way, folks, this was the first ever national advertising campaign that Trivent has done, but it's already won two Stevie Awards this year. So congratulations on that as well. But you have been leading this transformation, you know, in, including this relaunch of your brand last year. So what has it been like leading through this time and any key learnings that you can share with us? Well, thanks, Shri. And, and yes, we are very proud of our, of our national advertising campaign, um, but it has certainly been really quite a year. And for us, as challenging of a time as it's been, I think it's really brought out, brought out the best of us in Thrivent. So, you know, as an organization, we've been continuing to focus on fulfilling our, our purpose and our promise, helping people achieve financial clarity and lead lives full of meaning and gratitude. That is core to, to our being. Um, this past year also taught us to be much more nimble and adaptable as leaders and as a workforce. Um, as a leader, it required really a different type of sustained leadership. We had to focus on supporting our, our employees while also ensuring that our teams had what they needed to do to, to serve our clients well. And, um, and, and so, so early in March of 2020, we created two SWAT teams. One was really dedicated to, to making sure our workforce had what they needed, our employees. I mean, we, we moved into a remote environment in about three weeks. And, and it was new for all of us. And so making sure that we were listening to our workforce and making sure we were meeting their needs um, and so that we could successfully and we did successfully work remotely. The second SWAT team was really designed to make sure that our clients and our financial advisors had everything that they needed in order to continue to serve our clients and making sure that our clients felt like we were there for them because this, this, this pandemic was impacting everyone. 
And so we had to learn to adapt in a new way of working in a virtual world. And it's nothing like a good pandemic to, to make sure you do it really quickly. Um, it was also a really interesting time to land, launch a brand. We had intended on, on launching our brand in the summer of 2020. And of course, then the pandemic came. And, and if you think about it, um, and the commercial you saw, um, we couldn't find actors at first uh, because no one was available. And so we had to be innovative and we tried um, you know, different, different ways of, of, of having commercials. And, and ultimately ended up with three fabulous different commercials. And the one you saw were, were actors that, that one of our producers found they were her, the neighbors of, of, the act, of the producer. So again, being that innovative, creative and adaptable um, is what we, had to, what we had to learn to do. And as a result, wow, we won two Stevie Awards. Amazing, really. I know you talk about being nimble and adaptable, which was so critical at this time. You know, overall, what, do you, what has been happening in the financial services industry? I mean, you know, there's, you know, you talked about critical services, you know, what are, what are the critical issues facing financial services as a whole? And how are you addressing some of those issues? I mean, apart from this uh, transformation right now? You know, I think, um, you know, we came, came through this year uh, with the pandemic in particular, and I think we were all confronted in some way with the fragility of life over the past year. So, so while I don't know if consumers are thinking about life insurance specifically, I do think being prepared for the unexpected is top of mind for many, many people. And so right now, I would say it's the perfect time for us in financial services to step up and have conversations that really help people understand that they can financially prepare for the unexpected. And now that the economy is picking up, I think many people are still evaluating their risk tolerance when it comes to their investment portfolios. Uh, but as we know, procrastination can be a powerful thing and many people hold off on, on putting together a good plan. People are busy. And especially now as we're emerging from the pandemic, I think we're already seeing schedules and calendars fill up. And so it's easy to procrastinate putting a financial strategy in place. So I think if it's similar to exercise, and we know we should all exercise daily, but it's so easy to put it off. And, and when I think of exercise, I think of Peloton. Peloton, it's a bike, it's a treadmill. But for some reason, they became a disruptor in that space. And they did that because they created the motivation inside the bike and the treadmill. And so at Thrivent, we're trying to think about how can we be that disruptor in financial services like Peloton has been in the fitness industry. I love that. I think, you know, being the peloton of the financial services industry, I think that's a, an amazing way to think about, you know, the products and services you offer and how do you keep people motivated to stay on track with their finances. I think that's amazing. Um, you know, going back to, you know, some uh, uh, things that you talked about earlier and, you know, which also came out in the, in the uh, advertisement, you know, we hear a lot about the importance of companies leading with purpose these days, right? I mean, so it's, uh, uh, and, and you also shared that Thrivent is one of the original purpose-driven companies. I know for our students, for instance, they are all interested in joining companies which, who are purpose-driven. So what does that mean for Thrivent? How do you define it? How do you, uh, you know, connect this purpose with, you know, the, with the imperative of making a profit as well? Well, I think it really comes down to, for us, it's really uh, driven by this deeper calling at our core. And, and it's this whole notion of we believe humanity thrives when people make the most of all we've been given. And, and you know, we really do exist to, to help our clients, but also society. And, and so we weren't really founded as a business venture. If, if you think about our founding, it was really to meet a societal need. The need at the time was, was financial security. And so that if someone else got killed by a mill explosion, they had that, that financial security. And so, so to me, and in our workforce, we have a tremendous workforce, but it's, it's embedded in our DNA, this purpose. We, we have purpose 
going out of our pores because it's so important for us. We, we get to impact the lives of so many people each and every day and make sure that they're able to, to really lead that life full of meaning and gratitude. And for us, it really is that, that principle around we believe money is a tool, not the goal. And so we really want to help our clients lead the life of meaning and gratitude today as well as in the future. Um, and so when, when you have that kind of purpose behind you, um, it's, 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 it's meaningful work and it's exciting and our workforce feels that each and every day. And so it's, and, and it also shows up the way our, our clients show up. I mean, we see examples of that all the time. The pandemic was a great example. You know, um, the, our clients who have had long-term financial plans in place, you know, and the pandemic, they were calling their financial advisor saying, how can we do more? There are so many people in the country right now that are in need. How can we do more to make sure that we're, we're helping our community and helping society get through this? And so, and so that's, that's pretty remarkable when you think about it. And so we, we, had a, we, did, we put together a very quick campaign. We called it Make a Difference from Afar. And literally in, in probably a short, very short period of time, over 46,000 of our clients, along with their friends and family and neighbors, generated more than $14 million of much needed financial support for more than 18,000 not-for-profit organizations and churches around the country. And so this is really a great example of our purpose and our promise in action. That's amazing. I mean, again, this is inspiring generosity. One of your principles, you know, really you know, put into practice and uh, that, you know, that is, uh, you know, that you actually help your clients realize how to sort of achieve their own uh, goals towards generosity is, is just amazing that I, I'm, I'm uh, you know, hats off to you for doing that. You know, I, at this point, I'd like to sort of switch to a little bit more of a, you know, a personal story. I mean, who is Terry Rasmussen? How did she come to be who she is? You know, you know let's talk a little bit about your personal journey uh, you know, we didn't go into it in too much detail, but you really had a, a very interesting career. I mean, you started out at the Department of Justice and then at American Express in the general counsel's office, then holding the general counsel role at Thrivent itself. I mean, you've moved, you're one of the people who moved from general counsel into the business function when you became president of Thrivent's core business unit. And now you're the first female CEO at Thrivent. So how do you think about your journey and how did you get to where you are? Well, I I'd, I'd like to think I got to where I am because I said yes a lot, um, but I'm going to first even step back um, because uh, you know, I, I think I might be the only dental hygienist, CPA, general counsel, CEO in the world. And if there's another one, I'd really like to meet you. Um, and I bet I really caught your attention with um, being a dental hygienist. So when I was growing up uh, on the farm, I had an older sister and a younger brother. And it was quite obvious what the gifts that they had been given. Um, but it wasn't really clear with me. And so I was really struggling with what to do. And so one day my dad suggested I become a dental hygienist and he, he gave me all the reasons why. And I said, well, why not? And so I said, yes. And as I, as I you know, became a dental hygienist, I started to realize that I also had the love of learning. And so I started to unpack other gifts that I'd been given. And it's really those other gifts that I think, which led me on a very unique career journey, marked really by a pattern of saying, why not, or yes, just embracing and, and saying yes when asked. And so once I said yes, I made sure I did the best I could. That was an expectation that my dad instilled in me in a very young age is whatever I did, I was expected to do it to the best of my ability. And, um, and that's what I've always tried to do. So even in my current role, it really wasn't something that I aspired to, uh, but I got here because I courageously said yes as opportunities arose and in different points of my career. That's uh, again, amazing, um, Terry. Just, uh, you know, this idea of unpacking your gifts, you know, how, how did you figure out from being a dental hygienist that that you know, law may be the thing for you. I mean, that that's a pretty big switch. You know, was there a 
person or an incident or an event that prompted that to happen? Well, you know, it's funny. I'm smiling because uh, when I when I actually got to college, it's when I really discovered I love to learn. And so I, I actually wanted to go right to graduate school. And um, and and so at the time, you know, I was looking at, um, you know, a career in medicine, a, a career in law, um, you know, a career as a dentist. But what I discovered about myself when I was a dental hygienist is you kind of have to be an electrician and a plumber when you're a dentist. And I was neither. Uh, and so um, so uh, as I was exploring, you know, how long it would take me to get to graduate school and, and graduate from graduate school, um, I ended up just focusing really on on the law. And in part, my sister-in-law is a CPA and I was, um, my dental hygiene degree was a two-year degree. And so I had to get a four-year degree and, and she brought her books home one day and I said, well, that looks kind of interesting. And so I embarked on getting my four-year degree in 18 months and then went on to law school. Um, and it was really driven more by my love of learning um, than really being you know, intentional about specifically uh, a legal career, but it, it, was, it was perfect for me. How amazing, you know, an electrician and a plumber. And, you know, I'm sure somewhere some of those skills still come in handy. <laughs> uh, you know, I, you've now been, what, now three years as CEO. And I'm really curious, how is the CEO position different from anything else you've done so far? Uh, how has that been for you personally? I mean, what have you learned about yourself? or perhaps about even the organization that you didn't know before you took this job on? Well, I think, um, you know, one of the things that, that I've often, or I've learned that really kind of this role has reinforced is, is um, personally, I'm not afraid of failure. I, I view failure as a learning opportunity. And so if you don't, try something, um, you will have missed the opportunity to learn. And, and so for me, it's this, how do we, you know, how do I actually help, help um, our workforce see that there's, there's positive in creating a learning culture where you're gonna try things and not everything is gonna work out as you intended, but you're gonna learn along the way, which I would say in my experience, I've learned a lot more from the things that didn't turn out quite exactly how I expected them to, um, but it really did shape um, my curiosity. You know, the other thing that I've, I, I've known about myself, but I think the pandemic, has also reinforced this is in times of, of chaos and crisis, um, it's really important to be the calm in the eye of the storm. And, and so as, as things get more hectic and crazy, I, ha I have a tendency to get calmer because I, I, I know that if, if I'm calm, hopefully other people will be calm and we'll make better decisions as a result. I do believe in being prepared, but, but there's this calm in the eye of the storm where you can clear your head and make good decisions. And then as a leader, um, which I think, you know, this role certainly has, has reinforced that as well, is I am very clear on what I can control and what I can't control. And I can focus on the things that I can control, but but the things outside of your control, you just have to learn to adapt and be nimble. And you know, I mean, I, I used to say sometimes, well, sometimes you just can't make up these facts. You know, we we get a little chuckle and laugh, but you do have to just address, um, you know, and and deal with those things that are really outside of your control. And and the other thing I've learned, and I've been so proud at Thriving of our workforce is is you know, when you're in a crisis or challenges, the power of people coming together. I've seen some of the best work we've ever done at Thrivent, and it's been exciting because we were united in a common purpose and a common promise, and we knew what had to get done, and we overcame these challenges and delivered some phenomenal work. What, what great lessons, Terry. I mean, first of all, just this, you your passion for learning, which has you know, guided you all the way, and then staying calm in the eye of the storm. I think that's such a great, great lesson. And the final thing that you know, focus on what you can control and the stuff you can't control, you just have to kind of be nimble and agile and adapt to it. I think these are just terrific, terrific lessons. And I also think that your, this, the third point about 
you know, focusing on what you can control and, you know, and maybe sort of letting go of what you can't to some extent or just being able to respond, that probably also contributes to your being able to be calm in the eye of the <laughs> storm, right? I mean, I think that's a huge, huge uh, uh, personality trait, which I think is uh, serving you extremely well. And I, you know, I would encourage all of our students also to think about that with this, you know, the idea of calm in the face of the, in the, in the center of the storm. But you know, coming back, back to our students now, I know we are a higher education institution and we have a wonderful partnership with Trivent. Thank you for that. But I would love to know what are some of the key ways in which we in higher education should be equipping our students for a career in financial services, especially with the changes that you're seeing happening in this uh, industry. Well, I think um, I'll, I'll put in a plug here. I think it's a great, time to join the financial services industry. We need such a wide variety of skill sets in all sorts of areas. I mean, in business management, in operations, in human resources, in IT, in marketing, but we also need people who think differently and, and people who see the potential in something and come equipped to help companies to change the world for the better. You are all, for the most part, digital natives. And, and we can learn so much from you. You are all consumers. And so in financial services, I think we have yet to really turn the corner and become customer centric and, and really digital first companies. And so we could really use your help because you grew up in that environment. Um, I have to say, I am very energized by the talented people I see joining our organization. And I'm really grateful for the ways the Carlson School and the University of Minnesota are preparing the future workforce. We need you, we need your ideas, we need your, your, your creative thinking, we need your diverse perspectives to really um, help us on this journey. Thank you, Terry. And um, I know the audience has many, many interesting questions. I've been seeing some of them myself. So at this point, I will turn to our audience. Uh, you know, what questions or comments do you have for Terry? And uh, Amy, you, you can read them, uh, read the audience questions out. Yes, thank you, Terry. We've got lots of great questions coming through. Um, the first one is, you mentioned that one of your pillars is trust. How do you get trust across to your customers? That's a, that's a great question. And in part, um, you have to build trust. And, and I'll, I'll give you an example of something that we did probably five years ago now. As we surveyed the landscape, we saw that the fastest growing Christian population was the Hispanic uh, population in the United States. And so we decided that we wanted to focus on creating a pilot to see how could we serve. Because outside of, of you know very few companies, no one had really cracked the, the code, if you will, on serving the Hispanic market. So we narrowed it down to, to um, second and third generation Mexican Americans in San Antonio, Texas. And, and the first thing that they told us was they'd never heard of us. And, and so trust was a huge part of us. And so we became a part of the community. We hired from the community. We, we actually were engaged in the community and we spent the first probably nine months to a year just establishing us as a, as a credible trusted partner for them in the community. And so that's the first part is, is making sure that one, you're, you become a part of the community, that you hire from the community and that you, you establish that trust, that, that trusted partner. Thank you so much. Um, our second question is, what are the top two or three skills Thrivent looks for in their employees? Well, I would like to say intellectual curiosity. And so being curious, um, I, I would all, I also like to, to look for someone who has an outside in perspective. And so, you know, they're they're understanding what's happening in the world, what's happening across industries. Because what I find today is, is we have a lot to learn from the retail industry as far as being that customer centric organization. And so, so how, can, how can you, you demonstrate learning agility and so that you can understand your consumer experience 
and then translate that into a financial services experience. Thank you. Um, someone here has been listening and says, you have a great new building. How have the plans for the new building changed since the pandemic hit? Well, we have a beautiful building. In fact, I'm here today. I'm so excited. And, and we are in the process now of, of bringing back our workforce. And so in July 1st, we announced we're going to go to phase two, which is a voluntary phase. And so that people can come and experience this great building. You know, I, I often say that, you know, there's, um, there's a, there's a, uh, you know, I, I think we're always blessed as an organization because we have this spectacular new building. It, it is, um, it's got a lot of collaboration space, but it's got a lot of a very functional space where it will serve us extraordinarily well post pandemic. And so I'm excited for um, our workforce to get back into the building. We also have a huge campus in Appleton, Wisconsin. And so I'm anxious for people to, to get back into that building as well. I bet it sounds lovely. Um, someone is asking, what has or what have you been the most proud of in your career? You know, I would say, um, you know, just the I, I think at Thrivent here, the excitement and the energy that I feel with our workforce in what a societal impact we're making to those we serve. To me, that is, I think, the highlight of my career is, is seeing that impact and, and seeing our workforce so excited. We have such a dedicated workforce. I'll give you an example of, you know, just the, the kind of caring and compassionate people we attract. So in the pandemic, uh, we, we have long-term care insurance. And, and as many of you know, the long-term care facilities had um, some real outbreaks with, with COVID-19. And, and so one day, one of our call center employees received a call from a family and their mother was in a long-term care facility. It was a facility that was, was, was fine, but she was really isolated and feeling very lonely. And they were wondering if we would still honor the claim if they took her out of the facility. And so he quickly ran it up the flagpole. The answer came absolutely. And, um, and so, you know, we said, of course, we're going to honor that. And so now, um, literally, I think it was about six weeks ago, and I think her birthday is tomorrow. Um, but but the, our, our client is going to be, I think she's going to be 98 tomorrow. She's back in her assisted living facility, and, and they've all been vaccinated. And so there's social activities again, and the family was so grateful. And they said, when she celebrates her birthday, we're going to thank Thrivent because of what you did. And and that's the kind of organization we are. That's the kind of employee we attract is someone who really wants to, to do well by those we serve and make sure that they're well taken care of. It's a lovely story. Thank you. Um, Alan is asking, you said that you say yes a lot. When was saying no critical to your success? Oh, wow. Um, I, I, I have to say that whenever I have done a, when I've done a job change, I've always been really clear in my mind on, am I running from something or to something? So I always am very, very clear on that. And if I'm running from something, I say no. Um, because, because the likelihood of me experiencing that at the next stop is high. And so I want to make sure that I was always running to something, not from something. And so, so when I said no, it was because I knew in my, my head that I was running from something and that wasn't a reason to leave. Sounds good. Um, this is a question for both of you, Sheree and Terry. Um, Anna says, I am both a Carlson graduate and a current Thrivent employee, and I appreciate each of your leadership skills and success. This is a question for both of you. Could you please share some recommendations of podcasts, books, or any other resources that have most shaped your leadership styles personality? You know, I think I'm going to let Terry take this one first, because 
the reality of my life in the last few years is there's not been a lot of time for podcasts or, you know, and I have a huge stack of partially read books on my bedside table. So it's been a little difficult to uh, really say that um, there's been one book that's, or one podcast that's influenced me. Having said that, I just try and listen in on as many speakers as I can. I mean, the first Tuesday series itself has been phenomenal. We've had some great speakers and you've just heard from Terry again today. I mean, there's so many interesting insights that I pick up from these uh, sessions. So with that, Terry, I'll hand it back to you. <laughs> well, thank you. And and um, so so I'm actually going to share um, two, two books and they're recent for me. And so the first is last week we had our senior leader summit and uh, and we heard from um, Alan Malahi who turned around Ford. And so American Icon, I'm, um, I'm reading that. Uh, over the weekend, I finished um, Hubert Jolly's book, um, The Heart of Business. And, and I was struck by, you know, just, you know, Hubert's and Alan Malahi's, you know, their principles of leadership. Um, it really is about leadership and it's really about caring for your workforce and making sure that your workforce finds perfect purpose and deep meaning in the work. And, and I couldn't agree more, um, you know, and so so to me, both of those books, I thought were were terrific and, and instructional. Thank you. Um, we're getting a question right now. What are Thrivent's top two or three challenges right now besides getting people back into the office? Well, I would say, um, you know, right now, I as a part of, of uh, when we believe humanity thrives when we make the most of all we've been given is this whole notion that everyone deserves a plan. You know, if I, if I think about my, my personal journey um, you know, it was unpacking the gifts that you've been given, and not everyone has the opportunity to actually unpack the gifts they've been given. So how do we, how do we really mobilize again these volunteers where we can actually help people understand the gifts that they've been given, help them translate that into uh, an economic, sustainable future, and, and then get, get them on the path. I mean, I, I do think there is, um, you know, it, I mean, I, I use Peloton as an example. Um, as, as the Thriving employees know, I'm also a fan of the Noom app because I think they're in weight loss. They've been able to, to integrate that motivation with, with what people um, obviously know what to do, but it's so hard to do. And so I think that's our challenge is, is really as, as an organization, everyone knows that you, you should spend less than you make that you, I mean, there's just certain things that everyone knows and yet it's so hard for people to do. So, so I think our biggest challenge is that creating that motivation for people to do what they know they should be doing. Great. We are getting a lot of questions about Thrivent getting back into the office. This one's a little bit differently. It says, since you are back in the office, would you share how the office or remote work will be viewed at Thrivent? And what role do you see the office playing in the work? So we have we have proven very successfully that we can work remotely. I mean, that is that is a given. And I I have always been a proponent for flexibility in the workplace. And so I think much like most organizations, I envision a hybrid model in our future. Now, the what I think what I when I listen to our workforce, I think what people are missing the most is the collaboration. And, and collaboration is harder to do on Zoom. It just is. Um, there's nothing like a great whiteboard where you're walking around and generating ideas. And so, so in a hybrid model, who are the teams that have to come together? And it may not be your functional groups. It may be cross-functional, cross-organizational groups that have to come together at teams. And so, so in a hybrid model, that's what we're trying to figure out. Um, but, but, but I think to compete for the, the workforce of tomorrow, flexibility is here to stay. And so, so we, are, we are planning for that, we're expecting that, and, and we would encourage it um, because it's, um, I, throughout my career, and I'll go back, this was well before a pandemic, 
but there were times where I would hide at home to get work done because I was just more productive. And so this whole notion of, you know, um, I say we dress for the day, maybe we'll have to figure out where we're going to work for the day, um, depending on our circumstance. Thank you. We got a question about any any recommendations for upcoming leaders in healthcare. So I think someone's looking for some advice or what you're thinking about the healthcare industry. Well, um, uh, in in the healthcare industry, so I, I'll, I'll in true confession here, I have a daughter who is a, a consultant um, in healthcare, and I have a son who's a doctor. So um, so I would say. Um, you know, what I've seen particularly in uh, watching my son in, in being a doctor through the pandemic is the, the emergence of telemedicine and the emergence of, of you know, I think, uh, I think that's here to stay. You know, I, I do think that, um, you know, if you think about healthcare, uh, you know, I, I think of my daughter in, in the consulting side and, and how do they start to make sure that there's more affordable care, you know, across the spectrum. I, I think healthcare has some of those challenges, but I think this, again, the silver lining with this pandemic has opened possibilities that I believe weren't there before. Thank you. Um, Tony is asking, Thriven's mission to enable members to get others in their communities is outstanding. Has Thriven considered taking this further to help members invest in the local businesses, particularly those in urban areas maybe impacted by COVID or the unrest over the past year? Well, not yet, but let me tell you our first step. And so, so one of the things that we, we do have is, is we have a retail mutual fund that um, invests in churches. And so that was our, our first foray into bringing, you know, the, the vibrancy of your local congregation and, and allowing people to invest in a fund that invests in, in church loans. And so um, I'll bring that idea back to, to our mutual fund folks as well. But we're seeing, you know, um, we're, we're, we're generating ideas like that all the time. That sounds great. Um, we have one more question about data science. Um, is Thriven increasing its use of data science, artificial intelligence, machine learning? And if so, in what way and what have been the results? So, so I would say um, over the last several years, we have been really focusing on, on data. Uh, we probably need a lot more data scientists. And so, um, you know, I, I would say that's a that's a very growing field. And and I would I would probably say we're at the crawling stage right now, um, not the walk or run stage. And so we're we're um, we're exploring ways of you know, how can we how can we use data? And 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 let me let me let me step back a little bit on that because we have reams of data. In fact, we've got lots of data around our financial advisors, around our products, um, around all of our solutions. Um, and and we, have, we have data on our clients, but not as much data as we need. And so we're really starting to focus on to become truly a client-centric organization. We need to actually invest um, more in making sure that we're understanding our clients. Um, and that's actually my meeting later this week to, to kind of map out what are we going to do? How are we going to make those investments to really launch us in a significant way to becoming that client centric organization where we have data that will help us make decisions around um, serving our clients better? All right, thank you. Um, Sheree, we have one more question. Um, how are you seeing fintechs? and their high valuations changing the financial services industry and Thrivent? Yeah, I think, um, you know, fintechs are, are we, we study them and watch what they're doing. For the most part in our industry right now, they've been really focusing on backend um, processes. And so um, it is, it's straight through processing, it's, it's more automation. Um, and, and yet I'm, I'm expecting, and I'm, I'm sure there's some enterprising entrepreneur out there that when you think of the era of blockchain, and if you think about life insurance companies in particular are in the, the business of making promises, 
Um, I'm sure there's an enterprising entrepreneur that's trying to figure out how could you highly customize those promises um, in, in leveraging blockchain. Um, and uh, because that would truly be a disruptor in our industry. Uh, but I would say um, the, the rest of, of what's happening in fintech really does help us with productivity and efficiency. Um, I'm not seeing any breakthrough um, outside of, you know, maybe a, a lemonade out there, um, which is in the property casualty business. I'm not seeing that kind of breakthrough in the, in the life insurance industry. Thank you, Terry. That's, uh, thank you for joining us today. And, uh... You know, I'm. Uh, if there's anything we can do to help you go from crawling stage to, uh, you know, uh, to the, you know, maybe the, you know, uh, walking stage. You know, at the Carlson School, we have a very strong business analytics faculty and a program in the in uh, a Master of Science in Business Analytics. So we have a lot of data scientists, and and we have something called the Analytics uh, Analytics for Good Institute, where we are really concerned about you know, analytics being handled with a human touch with, uh, uh, and, and how do we use it to solve societal problems? So would look forward to, you know, collaborating with you on any of that, if you're interested. Oh, that would be wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> and also I'm glad you, you've gotten at least one idea from our conversation, which is to <laughs> see if you can get your clients to, or to get, you know, get funds to yeah. invest in uh, businesses in town, which are, have, which have been hurt. So thank you for uh, for that. And this has been a wonderful conversation and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I and certainly did. Audience, again, you know, thank you so much for joining us this academic year. And, you know, first Tuesday, we will be back. We'll be taking a summer break. And I hope all of you do too, before resuming in August. And our first speaker in uh, for the next academic year in August will be Bill Lynch who's the chief customer experience officer at Delta and talk about an industry where so much has changed and the customer experience has been so central. So I hope all of you will come back and join us for that one. And uh, as I mentioned also, we're we, are, we are looking forward to having our speakers, our audience, our students, everybody return to campus while also live streaming first Tuesday in the future. So we continue to get folks like Maria from Buenos Aires who's been listening in today. So this is amazing that, uh, you know, the global reach that we've been able to accomplish with this uh, virtual format. So in any case, we'll have more information on all of that on our website in the coming months. And again, I hope all of you are able to take some time to rest this summer and, uh, you know, and meet up again with your family and loved ones. And I understand hugs are back, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, for those of you who've registered for today's post event networking, you can, you'll have to exit this Zoom meeting and use the link in your confirmation email for the networking portion. I think the link has also been posted in the chat. So if you'd like to stick around and meet others who attended today's event, you just have to copy that link and uh, paste it into your browser. So hope to see you around. And again, thank you so much, Terry for a very, very stimulating uh, conversation. Well, thank you, Sri, and enjoy the summer, everybody. Yes, absolutely. Have a great summer and have the rest, great rest of your day as well. Thank, thank you. you.